I mean, if you're training that hard, um, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that you are engaging in an activity that your body doesn't want to do. We have Mark Sisson by request, because we do listen to and appreciate all your emails and YouTube comments about what content's important to you. And one of them that came up uh, with some popularity is, what do I do after a really tough workout to help boost my recovery and my adaptation to the right. training? Well, I mean, there's several things you can do after a really tough workout. And I guess the first question would be, what defines a really tough workout? Mm -hmm. Is it one that, uh, as the British used to say in the running circles, leaves you truly knackered? Knackered. Uh, or is it, uh, you know, one that's just a, a normal hard workout like you would do three or four times a week? Is it what I used to call a breakthrough workout in the original training and racing biathlons before it was training and racing duathlons? Uh, a breakthrough workout, which, you know, again, left you pretty much beat, but was gonna put you at another level, you know, throughout your life. So, so we, we almost have to start by defining what a, what a truly hard workout is. Having said that, um, because, because with a truly hard workout like that, I, I would literally look at a three-day recovery mm -hmm. from one of those sort of breakthrough workouts. Doesn't mean you wouldn't train the next three days, but you would be very, very specific about how you train. But on a day-to-day -day basis, how you would look at recovering from a hard workout um, you know, that, that um, was going to maybe affect the rest of your day. Uh, in the old days, we might have said, like in triathlon days, well, you take a nap, um, and then you maybe watch TV and eat some food and, you know. Stuff get, your face stuff with your face whatever you're. Get ready to do it again tomorrow. But no, the, the, probably the, the better scientific approach is to start almost immediately with just lying down, um, maybe elevating the legs a little bit, for 10 minutes and just breathing and allowing the parasympathetic nervous system to kick in, uh, the repair mechanisms to kick in. Uh, this, is why, uh, this is why whenever I do yoga, Shavasana is my favorite pose. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't know, look it up. <laughs> it's just it's difficult to learn. Just kind of lying there. Uh, then, um, almost contrary, flipping the switch, I would then I consciously move around a lot the rest of the day, not doing strenuous exercise or anything like that, but just moving, just walking, um, you know, crawling, uh, squatting, standing, whatever it is that you're doing in normal life, don't confine yourself to the sofa or the desk, but in fact, move around a lot. Um, I've noticed that one of the issues I had with uh, playing ultimate frisbee in Malibu now that I, when I'm in Los Angeles, I stay in Pacific Palisades, it was about a 40 minute drive, is, mm -hmm. is after the game's over, if I get in the car and drive 40 minutes home too soon after the game, I pay for it for the next three days with stiffness and mm -hmm. soreness and things like that. So, so this idea of moving around a lot through different ranges and planes of motion is an important part of your, of your strategy. Um, I think uh, third, we, we do need to talk about the refeed at some point, we need to look at uh, the caloric expenditure of the workout, the amount of glycogen that was depleted in the workout, because almost by definition, a hard workout is going to deplete glycogen. And so we would look at maybe uh, what, what um, you know, four hours later, we might start to refeed. But, that, but the four hours is an interesting uh, metric in and of itself. Not immediately after. We don't talk about a post-workout meal. Uh, in terms of recovery. Uh, this fasting after the workout has an effect of, well, several fold. Number one, um, that's when autophagy, this cell repair, um, is at its peak. So it's when you're not eating that the body is undergoing autophagy and making these repairs. Um, and as we've discussed in the past um, in other videos, the old paradigm of a post-workout meal Mm -hmm. immediately after the workout to take advantage of this so-called 45 minute window of opportunity where your body was making more glycogen. Well, if you did the workout hard enough that, uh, that you're going to, you know, that you need to do that, you're not going to do it again tomorrow. So you don't need to refill the glycogen stores mm -hmm. immediately. They're going to fill anyway. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to accelerate the refilling of glycogen because, because you're contemplating doing it tomorrow. So now we have this this idea that we're going to not only um, fast for four hours, we're going to, and in so doing, we're going to, we're going to optimize autophagy. 
Uh, we are also going to take advantage of the pulse of growth hormone and testosterone that occurred in the workout. So when you do a hard workout, and particularly, let's just say, uh, like a heavy leg day, um, there is uh, a response in the body to increase uh, the amount of testosterone and growth hormone in, a, in an incremental amount. So there's this pulse of testosterone and, and growth hormone. Now, in the event that you decide to have a post-workout meal, the, the, the body's response to the increase in carbohydrate causes a rise in insulin, and insulin blunts, it, it, it blunts the, the growth hormone and the testosterone. So it sort of negates the entire reason that you did the workout in the first place. Yeah, okay, now you're gonna refill glycogen supply so you get to do it again tomorrow, but who wants to do that hard a workout the next day and the next day and the next day? So there's a lot of reasons to postpone this refeeding for up to four hours if you can. Now, some people have uh, challenged on this point and I've done a lot of personal experimentation with the desire to perform and recover as my main goal uh, rather than worrying about losing excess body fat or whatever. I I'm, I'm strictly want to see how I can adapt the best of this workout. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried these long fasting periods uh, in combination with uh, working on uh, ketogenic diet when we were first working on keto okay. reset diet, uh, doing these crazy workouts that were slightly too stressful and I've learned to dial those back and we have content about how to properly conduct a sprint workout. And then, oh, if I'm counting on my fingers, also being in the older age groups. So at times I've discovered myself, tough workout, maybe too tough, older age group, carb restriction in general because we're not eating crap, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then waiting a long period of time uh, before refeeding, what happens is I felt pretty good because the stress hormones are flowing. Sure, I'm still, sure. you know, you're uh, high, it, high from the workout. Yeah. And then 24 to 36 hours later, I'm looking in my uh, my log saying, oh, I kind of had a crash and burn experience where I, I really needed to take a nap a day after my sprint workout. Uh, maybe I should come home and prepare a, a super nutrition smoothie in the immediate aftermath in the interest of recovering. And so it's a it's a nuanced thing, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you can address, same with a lot of females who are right. already low body fat, probably, as they're typing the letter, are doing too many CrossFit sessions in a week, just like you described, where they, they do need to reload glycogen because their training is ill-advised. Yeah. Yeah. So let's float that in there, too, and talk about maybe some of the nuances to the optimal approach that you described. I mean, again, we... We have to really drill down. We have to get very granular on what these workouts look like. So if, if it's, in your case, you do a sprint day, you know, you're an older gentleman now, and your brain is still thinking that you're a sprinter from your <laughs> teens. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. And so you, you know, you, you, you dip too deep into the well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to cost you a day or two in terms of your recovery. You're going to feel like taking a nap the next day. The question I would ask is, you know, what is, the, what is the intent of the workout? Is the intent of the workout to have you feeling that way? <laughs> Could the workout have been um, as beneficial with two fewer sprints, mm -hmm. right? Could you have done, instead of doing 12 200s, could you have done eight 200s and still gotten a benefit from the workout and not have it take you down that much? That's the, you know, that's, the, that's that really fine line of adjusting your workout schedule to the point that, and it becomes even more necessary, the, the, the better your fitness level is. Because in order to break through to the next level of fitness, you really have to work harder. And mm -hmm. that working harder can take a toll on it. Look, I'm at 68, I'm not gonna set any PRs ever again. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna set a PR on the bench, I'm not gonna set a PR on the track. So the question isn't like, okay, how do I get to the next incremental level, but how do I maintain robust fitness without trashing my immune system. And so what, what is, where is that level mm -hmm. of work output that has me feeling like um, I, I ratcheted up a little bit from last week, um, but I didn't ratchet up so much or I didn't, I didn't break myself down so much that it's gonna take me three days to recover. But even if it does take me three days to recover, am I still better off for having done the workout? Maybe, maybe you are, maybe you were. Maybe that, you know, that, that feeling of being you know, uh, an older gentleman and having gone to the well too deep and having done the work, maybe the ultimate effect is that when you were 17, you could have recovered in a day <laughs> or two days. When you were 25, it might have taken two days or three days. When you're 55, maybe it takes three or four days to recover from that same effort of work. I mean, that's the really, that's the thing 
that is what, probably the biggest factor in getting older and training is you can probably do the same workloads, but it takes you longer mm -hmm. to recover. I remember when I was 38 and I was training with this guy. Um, and I was, I was riding with you when you were mm -hmm. the third ranked triathlete in the world. <laughs> and I could go out once in a while and I could ride with you. But <laughs> once I in a while. But I couldn't do it every yeah. day. So I, the, the days that I could do it, I'm like, all right, that was great. And I'm 30, 37, 38 years old. With minimal training. With minimal training, because yeah. I wasn't training hard. But then it would take me three or four days to recover. Yeah. But I, I wasn't worse off for having done it. I was probably better off for having done it. So, you know, we have to kind of look at the context of all these things. And, and I'll go back to the original premise of this video, which is, you know, how do you recover from a hard workout? You know, you, you, you spend 10 minutes just, uh, you know, lying down and letting the parasympathetics start to kick in. You move around a fair amount. Um, you don't eat for a while um, un unless you want to do it again <laughs> the next day. And then you do refeed. And the refeed can be contemplated to envision what it is you want to do the next day or two days later. I mean, if you're training that hard, um, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that you are engaging in an activity that your body doesn't want to do. Mm. Let's be clear on this. If you're training, if you're training hard enough to have to recover from a workout, then good for you because you're pushing the envelope and you're and you're you're you're, you're pressing the margins of your ability. But you're also engaging in something that the that the body doesn't want to do. The body wants to conserve energy. The body wants to take a nap. It wants you to sit on the sofa and watch TV. It wants you to be you know looking at your uh, at your devices. Um, it doesn't want to spend energy. So we're, we're going through this whole process of tricking the body into adapting to a workload that we're artificially creating because it'll make us stronger, more powerful, uh, look better naked, better body fat, whatever it is you're looking for. Those are the reasons that we're choosing to engage in this voluntary activity. Right. It's, it's in contrast with our genetic expectations for health, which right. are to do the bare minimum necessary to survive. That's what our ancestors did forever. To do the bare forever. minimum necessary to survive long enough to pass the genetic material along to the next generation. Full stop.